everyone to this evening's talk on this last weekend of the Cosmopolis Two programs. We are very, very pleased to have with us tonight Leanne from Sanfe Simpson, uh, who is going to draw you a little bit into her world through some storytelling. We had a wonderful session this afternoon in the reading group, um, having gone through some poet poetic and other uh, writing of Leanne's. I know we'll have a great discussion tonight after the talk led by some of those um, ideas and discussions earlier. So do say up your questions. Uh, I'm now actually going to introduce a wonderful programming partner, Lauren Wolf from the Columbia Global Center, Paris, um, with whom we have co-conceived this weekend for programs. And uh, for us, the Columbia Global Center and Lauren have been really important partners because we have been thinking along some of the same lines of how you bring different types of practice and creative thinking into new types of spaces for exchange. And so um, uh, I hope that we can continue to work together. And I encourage you also to have a look at what the Columbia Global Center are doing there, rolling out this very interesting thematic um, sessions, programs that bring together not only talks and reading groups, but also music and other forms of workshops and performance. A, the current program is around the associations of sirens, and then they'll be moving into a new season around Prometheus and technology uh, in the new year. So now, please make um, Lauren welcome, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, this rencontre with Catherine uh, that happened this, this fall has actually been one of the, the most beautiful rencontres that I've had in a very long time. And I'm so grateful to her for um, reaching out to us and for um, allowing us to have the opportunity to work to work with her and uh, here on Cosmopolis. And so we were trying to identify which weekend we might talk about water, which is one of the things we've been focusing on with our sirens theme. Water, voices that we might be wary of hearing or that we might not hear or or that might not speak up so readily. Uh, and we thought that this weekend, uh, focusing on the implications, might be the, the most appropriate. And so tonight I'm just so pleased to, to introduce you to Leanne Bedesanosak uh, Simpson who is a Mishisagi Nishinabe scholar, writer, and artist, and a member of the Alderville First Nation. Her debut collection of stories and songs, Islands of Decolonial de 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 Love, sorry, Islands of Decolonial Love, was chosen by Thomas King for the 2013 RBC Taylor Emerging Writer Award. The collection also includes a nine-track album of poetry and music. This Accident of Being Lost was published in April 2017 and is also accompanied uh, by an album which is called Flight with the L in parentheses, which was released in 2016 with RPM Records and includes collaborations with many other indigenous and non-indigenous musicians. Her latest book, As We Have Always Done, Indigenous Freedom, through Radical Resistance, was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2017. And I have to say, Leanne, when I was looking at one of your videos today, which is um, called Leaks, the song poem that, that you perform with your daughter, I was really struck by this title and struck kind of by the resonance with the last two, two lines of the poem. Um, you are not a vessel for white settler shame, even if I am the housing that failed you. And I was really struck by this world where you failed and you kind of puzzled by, by why that would be a word that, went, that you would use uh, given the context of the, of the poem. And then I thought about it and I was like, in this context of the kind of paradox of being blocked with this head and also dealing with kind of excessive water and circulation that has happened. Oh. 
from, from the sky, uh, it, it occurred to me that leaks is probably a perfect way to think about it and thinking about the beauty of that failure to hold it might be a really wonderful way um, to think about that too. So finding beauty in the failure um, because it's that failure that allows us all to, to come and to become. So on that note, please join me in welcoming the Nancy. Bonjour, Kinemaria, Gilgadu Jina de Noema, Kinegachi and Shabbat Golden and Donjaba, Nagojoani Nequadota, Patasa Sake, Magician Kaz, Nikachinata, Bibishan, Hebrew Watching Group, Miguach, Catherine, Minoa Lauren, for those kind words to start us off tonight. Bonjour, hi friends. I am Machi Sakik in Ishnabek or Ojibwe, and our territory is the North Shore of Lake Ontario, roughly between the cities of Toronto and Ottawa in Canada. My particular understanding of the world comes from this place. It comes from the Manchisaki Kinishnabek practice of life, living in deep relationality to the land, to the waters, the plants, the animals, and the peoples of Kina, Gachi, and Ishnabek, Ogaming, the place where we all live and work together. It comes from Neyano Nibimong Gishigaming, the Great Lakes. It comes from maple sugar bushes carrying and filtering water from the soil, combining it with light and converting it to sweet sugar. It comes from lake shores full of minomen, or wild rice, plants that gather strength in mid-July and move from floating on top of the water to standing. It comes from black bears that wake up in Makwangizis in February, turn in their dens on their beds of blueberry branches, and then settle back into fasting and dreaming for a few more weeks. This land has taught me that Anishinaabe life is a continual, reciprocal, reflective, and often critical interaction with my ancestors, those yet to be born, the nations of plants and animals I share land with, and it is a living constellation of co-resistance with all of the anti-colonial peoples and the worlds they build. Anishinaabe life is a persistent world-building process, despite the constant imposition of the colonial machinery of elimination. And this process for indigenous life and indigenous living that indigenous peoples have used long before our existence depended upon our ability to resist and survive the violence of capitalism, heteropatriarchy, and expansive dispossession. My ancestors woke up each morning and they built Anishinaabe life. They animated their system of governance and diplomacy. They built their collective philosophical and ethical understandings. They made processes for solving conflict and reestablishing balance. They built their economy with the consent of the plant and animal nations they shared with. They built and maintained and nurtured systems for sharing knowledge and taking care of each other. They worked collectively to produce, reproduce, replicate, amplify, and share Anishinaabe life because if they did not, Anishinaabe worlds would not exist. They were makers, and they got up and worked hard, not the white man wage labor of Monday to Friday, nine to five, not the kind of work where you outsource the labor of living so you can do something more important, but the kind of work that values the way one lives. They got up worked hard all day long to build a life, to build a world. This algorithm of living, theory, and praxis 
exceedingly intertwined and relationally responsive to one another is generated through relations in which he said we can land, land that is constructed and defined by our intimate spiritual, emotional, and physical relationship with it. Living as a creative act, self-determination, consent, kindness, and freedom at the core, replicated over and over, making as the material basis for experiencing and influencing the world, living with the purpose of generating more life, generating continual life. Our infrastructure for life was relationships, not institutions. Our orientation for life was internationalist, we shared space and time with plant and animal nations and different indigenous nations, mostly without the use of enclosures and violence. We did not bank capital to protect us against hard times. We had healthy reciprocal relationships with other worlds, neighboring indigenous nations, and in times of trouble, we relied upon this practice of relational diplomacy and the world it creates to survive with the understanding that in return, we would also take care of them. We have always been an intellectual and artistic people. We have always had theory, meaning, philosophy, and ethics. We have always used and made decisions about technology. In the colonial reality, we have always existed outside of the universal ideas of humanity, but within Anishinaabe thought, we don't have this division between humans and non-humans. We have a division between the living and the non-living, those beings that exist with spirit and therefore self-determination, who can move between worlds and non-living things like tables or cars or computers that do not have spirit. This is encoded in our language, which is mostly made up of verbs. And our verb endings are either animate for living things or inanimate for non-living things. There is a fluidity of this division because the present, both spatially and temporally, is made up of living beings from the past and from the future, some of which have physical forms and some of which do not. So what happens, what does the world look like when it's built upon living and non-living instead of human and non-human? In 1843, one of my Mississauga Machisagi Kanishinaabe ancestors, Mongwadeus, and a small group of performers left our territory for Europe. In 1845, they performed here in Paris for King Louis-Philippe in his palace at St. Cloud as part of George Catlin's traveling North American Indian show. Mongodius, like me, was also a writer in addition to a performer, and so he chronicled the trip in a manuscript published in 1848 entitled an account of the Chippewa Indians who have been traveling among the whites in the US, England, Ireland, Scotland, France, and Belgium, semicolon, with very interesting incidents in relation to the general characteristics of the English, Irish, Scotch, French, and Americans with regard to their hospitality, peculiarities, etc. It's a very long title. Mangudis, in this manuscript, returns the gaze. He turns the tables on two centuries of colonial othering. Mangudis, in the manuscript, makes it clear that he was aware of being read as a visiting curiosity. But by this time, he had quit the Methodist church. He had refused his English name and embraced Anishinaabe practices. In a sense, the trip to Europe was a flight path out of the violence of colonialism at a time where my nation was desecrated by a century of targeted violence designed to remove Anishinaabe bodies from Anishinaabe lands. His resistance is palatable to me in his writings. 
There were 11 Michi Sadiki Nishnabek traveling with Mongodias, including his wife, Awasi Gijigokwe, and their three children. I want to start tonight by saying their names. Mongodis, Se Segon, Gichi Asin, Moshimam, Animakan, Awapate, Zizak, Minisinu, Nidorinke, Awase Gijigokwe. Animoke, Sasagan, Mashishiman, Awase Gijigokwe, Zizak, Minisuno, and Noden all died of smallpox on this continent and they never returned home. Anishinaabe artist Robert Houle um, did a, an installation called Paris Ojibwe, which was a, a homage to, to uh, this, uh, this group of Mississauga uh, Anishinaabek. And like Robert, I'm thinking and carrying the resistance of these 12 into this city and into the space that they created for me today. I was thinking about them on the plane. I was holding them very close to my heart as I walked the streets. And tonight, I want to tell you and to tell them four stories. Stories that many of you will not have heard before, but words and stories that will be familiar to them. Telling stories has long been a foundational practice of the Anishinaabek. The practice of telling stories fills interstitial spaces like this one with sound, meaning, recognition, and affirmation with all of its generative and degenerative energies. It is a practice of listening with one's open heart to the sounds of Anishinaabek across time and space in all of its manifestations. The practice of telling stories is a practice of sharing theory, philosophy, history, and experience. It is a practice of deep relationality, not a looking at, but a looking with, or a looking through, or a thinking through together. The practice of telling stories is a practice of scaling and releasing sound across scales, articulating our individual experiences, relating them to collective experience, and generating systemic critique. More important than the telling is the culture of listening. The practice of telling stories is the practice of constantly building Anishinaabe worlds while simultaneously living in them without apology. I am a body made of stories and connection, a hub in the network of Anishinaabe living and my practice of telling the stories, our practice of telling stories, is one of the reasons that Mangwajis was here and that I'm here today in spite of the colonial machinery of elimination. Storytelling is a way of feeding our fires, and fire will not be confined by colonialism, whether it's capitalism, white supremacy, or heteropatriarchy. So today, I'm going to share four iterations of the same story. The first one is a very old Michi Sagi Kanishinaabek story that features Benonji. Benonji is a world that means child. The next one is a short sketch of a traditional uh, story about um, Nanabush, who is a trickster uh, spirit human character. The third one is from the um, this accident of being lost. It features kwe, which is a word for woman, and it is known as short fiction. The fourth is a film that we'll watch together called Bidavan. So there are four stories, and our responsibility then is to find that, that fifth understanding. You'll experience Anishinaabe aesthetics through repetition, coded and layered meanings, opaqueness, a complex practice of relationality, and an animate physical and spiritual realm. 
Story number one. Minonji is out walking in the bush one day. It's Zigwan. Zigwan is the first part of spring. It's sort of like your weather here today, cold and rainy. The lake is opening up. The snow is finally melting. They are feeling that first warmth of spring on their cheeks. Oh, Nikichi and they are thinking, I'm happy. Then that Benonji, who is out walking, collecting firewood for their dodong, decides to sit under the maple tree in an attic. Maybe just stretch out. Maybe have a little rest. Maybe gather firewood a little bit later. Oh, Nikichi Nendam Nongam. I'm feeling happy today, says that Benonji. And while that Benonji is lying down and looking up, they see squirrel up in a tree. Bonjour, Ajinamo. I hope you had a good winter. I hope you had enough food cached. But the squirrel doesn't look up because she's already busy. She's not collecting nuts. Going. She's not building her nest. Going, not yet. She's not looking after any young. Going, it's too early. She's just nibbling on the bark and then doing some sucking. Nibble, nibble, suck. Nibble, nibble, suck. Benonji is feeling a little curious, so they do that too on one of the low branches. Nibble, nibble, suck. Nibble, nibble, suck. Mm. <coughs> this stuff tastes good. It's real sweet water. Mm. Then Benonji gets thinking and they make a hole in that tree and they make a slide for that sweet water to run down. They make a quick container out of birch bark and they collect that sweet water and they take that sweet water home to show their mama. That Dodon is excited and she has 350 questions. Ah, Benonji, what is this? Where did you find it? Which tree? I taught you how to make it. Did you put Sema, tobacco? Did you say thank you? Have a sort of dripping. Does it happen all day? Does it happen all night? Where's the firewood? Benonji tells their Dodon the story and she believes every word because they are her Benonji and they love each other very much. Let's cook the meat in it tonight. It will be lovely sweet. Nahal. Nahal. So they cooked that meat in that sweet water and it was lovely sweet. It was extra lovely sweet. It was sweeter than just sweet water. The next day, Benonji takes their mama to that tree and their mama brings Nokomis and Nokomis brings all the aunties and there is a very big crowd and she saw Gikinish Nabekwewa and there is a very big lot of pressure. Benonji tells about the squirrel Benamji does the nibble nibble suck part, and at first there are technical difficulties, and none of it works. But Mama rubs Benamji's back. She tells Benamji that she believes them anyway, and they talk about lots of variables like heat and temperature and time, and then the sun comes out and warms everything up, and soon it's drip, drip, drip. Those aunties go crazy, sasa quick dancing around, hugging a bit too tight, high-kicking and high-fiving until they take it back home and boil it up and boil it down into sweet, sweet sugar. Ever since, every spring, those Machisa Geek and Ishnabai collect that sweet water and boil it up and boil it down into that sweet, sweet sugar. All thanks to Benonji and their lovely discovery. And to Ajinamo, the squirrel, and her precious teaching. And to the Natakuk, the maple trees, and their boundless sharing. Story number two. So this one time, Nanabush was out hiking, as they have always done, trying to visit with the Anishinaabe. 
and he couldn't find any of us in the bush, and this confused him because it was March and they should be in the sugar bush turning sap into sugar. So he looked and looked and looked, and eventually he found all of us lying on our backs, on our couches, watching Netflix and typing important things into our phones. Now this has happened before, many times actually, but the first time it happened, Nanavush was out hiking around as they have always done, trying to visit with the Anishinaabe, and he couldn't find us, so he looked and looked and looked, and finally that first time when he found us, we were all lying on our backs in the sugar bush with our feet up in the air and our mouths wide open with maple syrup dripping right in. That's right, the first time the story happened, it was so long ago that the Nanatagook weren't making sap, they were making syrup. Well, we learned that first time that when you don't get up and do the work to make a life, the world falls apart. So Nanabush goes to visit his grandmother and his grandmother teaches him the politics and the ethics of how to tap the trees and boil sap into sugar. She teaches him the songs and the ceremonies of how to tap trees and boil sap into sugar. She teaches him to drink sap every day for this Bacadol Jesus march. She teaches him how to bring all of the people, all of the clans into help to visit and to make decisions. So Nanabush goes back to the Anishinaabe in our sugar bush, and he goes out to the river, and he fills a bucket up with water, and climbs all the way to the top of the first maple tree, and then he pours that bucket down the tree. He goes back and forth with the bucket from the river to the tree 30 times, one for every day in this Bacadoke Jesus march. And maybe that's how this story happened. Maybe it was 30 buckets and it was 30 trips. Or maybe Nanabush was way too tired to love that heavy bucket of that tall maple. And maybe he was way too tired to do it 30 times. And maybe he has to go pee anyway. And maybe he decides to just whip it out when no one is looking and do a big long 30 bucket pee down the top of the tree and maybe that saves himself 30 trips to the river and 30 trips up the tree. Maybe it happened that way. But whatever way it happened, by the time the water got filtered all the way down through the maple tree, and by the time Nana Bush did every tree in that sugar bush, the syrup that was dripping into the mouths of the Anishinaabek wasn't syrup anymore. It was more like nabish. It was more like water. It was more like tree pee. <laughs> now let us talk to the Anishinaabe what Kukum, his grandmother, had taught him. And the Anishinaabe accepted that gift from Nanabush. And every year, no matter how hard it is, they make sure their lips taste the sweetness of Zizbaka Dolpe, even if it is just once, even if there isn't enough to make sugar. They take their kids, they tell the story of Nanabush, they listen to the heartbeat of the land as the sap falls into the pail. They cherish the gift given to their ancestors so long ago, and in their heart knowledge, hidden away in the most precious parts of their beings, they know that the sugar wasn't the real gift. They know that the real gift was in the making and that without love, making just isn't possible. Story number three is called Flight and it's from my book of short stories called This Accident of Being Lost. Lucy, Kwe, and I walked through the neighborhood last fall when all the trees looked like the time Nanabush hid his kukum in there, like they were being swallowed by flame arms of red and orange. We marked each one with a spray-painted purple thunderbird so we would know which ones are the sugar maples when their leaves are gone next spring. 
Really, we should be able to tell by now, just by looking at the bark and the way the branches hold themselves, that we're still too new at it. Claire was so pregnant, I made her stand back from the paint rooms. Lucy made a stencil so the Thunderbird would look like a Thunderbird and not the death mark the city puts on trees when they are about to cut them down for safety reasons. Now it's March and we had 30 tin buckets, 30 new spigots, tobacco, a drill, and two charged batteries, a three-eighths of an inch drill bit, 30 flyers to leave at the doors of the houses we're visiting. The neighborhood we're going into votes mostly for the new Democratic Party or the Liberals in provincial and federal elections, and they feel relief when they do. They have perennials instead of grass. They get organic local vegetables delivered to their doors twice weekly in addition to going to the farmer's market on Saturday. They're also trying to make our neighborhood into an Ontario heritage designation. I think that mostly means you can't do renovations that make your house look like it isn't from the 1800s or rent your extra floors to the lower class. We know how to do this so they'd be into it. I should hand out the flyers first, have a community meeting, ask permission. Listen to their paternalistic bullshit and feedback. Let them have influence. Let them bask in the light of the native people so they can feel self-righteous and like they have the solution. Make them feel better. And when reconciliation comes up at the next dinner party, they can hold us up as the solution and brag to their real friends about our plight. I proofread the flyer one more time because everyone knows white people hate typos. Hello. We are collecting sap from this maple tree from March 21st to the 23rd. We will be by to collect it once a day and we will pick up the bucket, lid, and spigot on March 23rd. Thank you for your support in our urban sugar making adventure, the FWP Collective. The Fourth World Collective is three Anishinaabe Kwewuk plus Beidi Nanatik plus Sabe, but the other two don't know he's here. I'm the only one that can see him in only sometimes. Lately, he has been texting me more than showing up in person because he has other clients. He rolls his eyes when I say I'm his client. We're meeting in my backyard to build a fire, smudge, and to make some offerings before we begin. The Fourth World Problems Collective had several meetings about the 48 words on the flyer in order to get the proper balance of telling, not asking, while also sidestepping suspicion. No one feels good about hiding the fact that we are Mississaugas and that this is us acting on our land, but no one wants to end up a dinner party conversation either. I fought hard for the word adventure because it is a signifier with this audience and it makes them hard of it and their only job is to file the flyer on top of the fridge with the bills and the permission slips and forget about it. They can be part of the solution without doing anything. This is the perfect get out of free, get out of jail free card. Free, liberal, in all its glory. No need to call the police or the cities. It's sustainable. Help the Indians and their plight. We debated framing this as performance art. Well, I debated framing this as performance art because white people love that, and if this were the fall and this was Nui Blanche, we'd be Indian art heroes. We could probably even get a grant. But it's the spring, and we actually don't want an audience if we can get away with it. We just want to make maple syrup in my backyard without it being a goddamn ordeal. Sabe texts to say he is running late. Koya is sitting on a white plastic lawn chair, breastfeeding baby Nanatic into a sleep coma by lifting up her not murdered, not missing t-shirt. She is laughing saying this is the least queer thing I do. I try to think of something smart to say, like there's nothing in the Indian queer handbook that says you can't have a baby or breastfeed, but she already knows that. So I just smile and nod. I'm thinking the curve of her breast is sacred and sexy. 
I'm thinking of how much I miss Prolact and I'm wishing the gentleness Quay has for the Nautic, Lucy has for me. Lucy is wearing my black leather motorcycle jacket, chain smoking out of range of the Nautic with the baby carrier at her, their feet ready to carry. They act tougher than they are. For Indians, the tougher we act, the purer our hearts are because this strangulation is not set up for sensitive and we have to protect ourselves. I wish they'd soften for me. I wish they'd drop it sometimes and let me in. I wish they could feel my warmth in a way that would compel them to give it back. I wish loving Lucy wasn't so lonely. I mumble some edition of a moin and put my offering in the fire. I think this in English because I don't know how to say any of it. But this is our sugar bush. It looks different because there are three streets and 150 houses and a thousand people living in it. But this is my sugar bush. It is our sugar bush. We are the only ones that are supposed to be here. Please help us. I think maybe I should be more specific because the magic of the spiritual world is never super clear to me. Obviously, I need their help. I'm an endless wandering pit of me. They must know that, but I also know it's important to ask. So what am I asking for? Help remembering everything? Help being undetected? Help collecting the sap the next day and boiling it down for 12 hours in my backyard? Help dealing with the authorities? Help while I sit at the edge of Lucy? I watch the flames as they disappear my tobacco and carry my thoughts to those that care. We each take our turn walking around the fire in the right direction, smudge the gear and put it into our backpacks, but we are not done feeding this fire. Kwe takes off her ceremony skirt, the one that she has thrown tobacco into the hem, but sometimes resents being forced to wear and she puts it on the fire. Lucy pours one shot of whiskey into the fire for their auntie that passed three years ago. I smoke my pipe even though there is blood because I am powerful and beautiful and sacred and I always deserve to be reminded. Then we carry the buckets and an attic to the car. I have three pieces of maple sugar from last year in my pocket in case we need to distract an attic from reality for a few minutes, just in case we need quiet. I think if I get caught, hide my kids. We drive the car around the corner to the first tree. It's darker and colder than I thought. I wish I could have worn my winter boots instead of my running shoes with plastic bird bags inside them to keep my feet dry. I set down my backpack on the packing snow and put a tiny pile of tobacco at the base of the tree. Claire takes an anotic out of the carrier, sits at the base of the tree nursing. I see salmon, eel, caribou, eagle, and crane circling our sugar bush at the end of the street. Lucy rubs their hand on her bark. I hope this doesn't hurt. Sada kisses my forehead, steps back, and then disappears. I hesitate, and I take out the drill. The last iteration of this story is a stop-motion animation film called Bidabin. Bidabin is our word for dawn. It means um, if you're watching the sun rise over the horizon, it's that first light that you see before the sun comes up. Um, if you split the word into, its, um, into the tiny parts that make it up, the bit is a um, prefix that means the future is coming towards us. The da is a word for home or the present, and ba or ban is a suffix that you would end you would add to the end of someone's name after they had died or after they had passed on. So it's the past. So bedaven, um, that moment each day when that first light comes up above the horizon is the present, and the present is a collapsing of the past and the future in on itself. 
Um, the filmmaker is a Métis filmmaker who's based in Vancouver. Her name is Amanda Strong. Um, Amanda's team of about 30 people worked on the film for three years, and it's a, um, it's a combination of The Gift is in the Making, which was the Nambush story that I told you, Plight, which is the story I just read, and uh, a poem called Caribou Ghosts. Um, so I think that we'll watch the film now, and then I'll come back and we can have a discussion. Or I can answer questions.
Stretch tags, chain checks, six pack, riff raff, deadening regret, a collection of old parts. We get these tiny gifts of tremendous, unclouded bypass due. We get these tiny moments, but there's never enough glue. We'll tie ourselves together with bungee cords, luck, bring the fish, the fire, the new knife. Catharsis is still elusive, so we'll save that for another day. Meet me at the underpass, rebellion is on their way. That's the daughter. people don't like to do. 
Um, also, you're in your you're inside the the lodge or your home a lot with your kids, and so there's a lot of time where you need to keep people's brains occupied, thinking through things. Um, so that's definitely another reason. And then the second kind of story we have are um, the Bajramalanin, which are your personal stories, um, the things that happen to you in your life. Everybody has has those stories. Um, everybody has a right to tell those stories. And so this presentation is sort of a, a weaving of, of both of those kinds of stories. Um, and the idea then I think is that um, particularly the Dhamma Sukkhanin are very um, layered and they're coded with meaning. There is a, often a very kind of simple literal narrative um, that those that are familiar with the story will kind of latch onto the first couple of times they hear it. Um, there's a deeper metaphorical meaning, there's a conceptual meaning, um, meaning shifts over time um, as you age or as you travel through your life and you gain new perspectives. And there's meaning shift in different contexts. A lot of our, our knowledge system is derived from context and not content. So um, it's an honor then to be able to kind of tell these stories in an, in an oral way um, to sort of simultaneously with you build the world that these characters live in, whether that's in, in your mind or, or my mind or, or collectively. Um, so that's sort of, this is a, it's difficult to do across languages, it's difficult to do across different epistemologies, um, it's difficult to move from a, an oral setting that's, that's deeply relational to the page. Um, so in the reading group, we had lots of conversations around, around translation. Um, but I think ultimately, I hope that, um, that some of what I, I share translated for you and for this audience as well. Yes, thank you. Is there someone else who has a question? can't let go of this question consent that we discussed already in the reading group um, and I wanted to say looking at the action of extracting the, the, the sweet water um, I was wondering how does that translate to a consensual action how does a tree give consent and can that teach us something about how people how we should think of consent with people uh, is it the offering could you explain that a bit because I thought that was very interesting it, yeah, I can, but it, it sort of gets to the, um, the foundation of how we construct the world. And so um, in the reading group, we were talking about the division between human and non-human, and I was trying to think through that um, with an initial other thought, and our division is between living and non-living. So one of the ways to, ex one of the answers to your question is to think about hunting. Um, if Anishinaabe people are going to hunt for wawashkesh or a deer, um, there's an assumption that there is um, our spirits are interacting with each other in, a, in the spiritual realm. Um, there is an assumption that we are both equals. Um, so we don't have this idea that humans have to be over the earth or that humans are smarter or, or are more important than the deer. So there's, we're sort of colleagues. And so if an initial family needs food, um, they would go and they would put an offering and they would pray to the spirit of, of the deer. So try to interact with the spirit of the deer in the spiritual realm. And then if the, the deer appears over the next few days or the next week in an opportunity uh, presents itself for the hunters, then they will they will kill that deer, returning a spirit to the spirit world, and then taking the meat. Um, and then they will there's sort of protocols and practices um, around uh, the use of that that meat and, and and how to treat the body. So you would take only what you need. You would use everything that you would take. You would share everything that comes from it. And then there's kind of specific rituals that date back to a, a story about um, the deer 
being upset with how the Anishinaabe were, were treating them. We were treating them in sort of an extractivist, um, overusing the resource kind of way, and the deer then withdrew their consent and left the territory. Then we had to go and find them. There was a diplomacy, there was medicine people, there was diplomats involved, there was a lot of negotiating to get the deer to come back. And the reasons why they agreed to come back um, are related to, to how those, those practices of how we treat deer, sharing everything, taking them in what you need. So that kind of process for consent we have with all of the different animals and the plants. Um, so the trees withdraw their consent. And I would say that the trees are withdrawing their consent right now, the maple trees, because they're being um, extremely impacted by global warming. So uh, my family and I have been running a sugar bush for the last 10 years, and the Anishinaabe knowledge about when the sap runs and when it and it stops running, um, and all of the sort of mechanics are very, very difficult to apply because the weather is so erratic. And because um, if you look at the commercial production of maple syrup, it has moved north from uh, the northern US, from Maine and Vermont into southern Quebec. So, um, the trees are, are um, it's just very, very unpredictable, and the, the time that they give the sap is, uh, is very short. So um, I would say that that is a, 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 you could interpret that as a withdrawal of consent because, um, and because we, the impact that we've had on the climate and on the environment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing um, these beautiful stories that are also centered kind of in this one story um, as well. And I really loved um, the last line of the poem in um, the video, the, the idea of um, meet me in the underpass, the rebellion is already on her way. That really stuck with me. And I think as someone who grew up in cities, uh, I can't help but think like for people who have had in many ways, their ancestry is kind of severed um, by capitalism and colonial structures. And for people who grew up kind of having to navigate their spiritual world in a way that's almost like growing back, where it's not inherited and not, give, not, not lived, but rather learned, and, and, and storytelling becoming a process in which you know, this learning process becomes. I wonder if um, maybe you can elaborate on how this rebellion extends beyond your community and how as people in, say, Paris or other cities, we can kind of together meet in the underpass, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good um, analysis of that last line. So I think a lot of indigenous people in Canada would share that experience that you're, you're talking about of having to to um, reclaim and go back and find and sort of pick up these fragments and, and try to grow them into, into new worlds. Um, and I think one of the, um, one of the <coughs> interventions that I, was, that I was trying to make with my work is to talk about um, Anishinaabe reality, not just from the local perspective, but from an international perspective. So, one of um, another Nanabush story um, from the beginning of the world is when Nadine goes and travels around and visits all of the people and all of the nations of the world as a way of um, learning about the place that, that they've been placed. Um, and that story generates the methodology for transmission and sharing of indigenous knowledge. But it also sort of generates a series of, I think, political and ethical responsibilities in terms of connecting to the anti-colonial movements um, of the world. And so it is very much a, an invitation for, for those movements to, to meet at the underpass. The underpass is, is deliberate in terms of urbanization in the city. Um, setting that story in the city, setting the dog in the city was deliberate because um, 60% of indigenous people in Canada are living in cities. Um, so it was, the idea was, you know, we talk about indigenous futures and or world building, but I guess my understanding is that we're building worlds 
right now on top of, in between, in interstitial spaces, um, wherever we can. And uh, I like that idea of, um, of actively doing it in real time as a presencing, um, because I think, again, within Anishinaabe thought, it's the presence that gives birth to the future. So you need to plant the seeds now, you need to set the infrastructure up now, and it, even if it fails, even if you don't get to make maple syrup, every time you, you live that story, not just tell the story, but live that story, embody it, um, new knowledge is generated. Story of plight, the idea of the city as violent um, is, is a recurring theme, um, especially with the lights and the way the houses move, and this idea of like the city kind of imposing on a ritual and, and the, the, the connection, fragmented connection. And I wonder, um, as people who are living in cities, um, how do, how, um, we live those connections and how we find and build those spaces. Um, uh, I thought it was really interesting it was portrayed like technology with um, the way uh, like the texting between the worlds was portrayed because I wonder um, do you see technology as kind of um, the possible avenue in which we um, kind of rebel against the fragmentation uh, of city life? I think um, I think that Anishinaabe people have had lots of technology um, in the past, and I I think that it would appall I think my ancestors that I have this phone, and I don't really know how it works. I don't know how it was made. If it breaks, I can't fix it. Um, I have no idea the um, impact that it is having on the global community, on plants and animals, on relationships. It's just been blindly and ubiquitously adopted. So I think that um, that critical thought around the adoption of technology is a really important first step before um, the foreign people would integrate it into, into society. So careful thought about impact. People would talk about seven generations ahead, how, 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 what are all of the ways that this is going to um, impact the, the network of relationships that we're a part of. And so in thinking through some of that, and technology certainly was an important part of the I don't know, more mobilization in Canada and the US, but there was, it was also um, the detriment to I think that mobilization as well, because I think at the end of the day, you can't replace um, organizing and face-to-face -face relationship building and um, the, rela the relationality parts of solidarity um, with with that kind of, of technology, so I think um, I think there needs to be a thinking through before that adoption, and so that's one of the reasons why um, we had those devices, the cell phone like devices in the film, um, so that we can start to have some of those conversations in terms of surveillance, in terms of hypercapitalism, in terms of all of those those types of things. Um, the city is also a place of um, for many indigenous youth growing up in the city, they it, it's a, a part of the dispossession. So they don't have access to their land, they don't have access to the culture, they don't have access to um, to elders. And I think the intervention here was that uh, our ancestors did it anyway. You go out and you do it anyway, and you build with what you have, and you take the fragments with what you have, and if you have to make maple sugar in a in you know, a downtown city amongst houses and cars and trees and roads, then you do it because when you do it, those um, those helpers show up. The Sabe character, who is like a, a big foot or a yeti character or an elder character, 
shows up, the, the, the wolves, the caribou, show up to help you. you know, there's, there's another, the, the world becomes animated and generative. Um, so it was very much to also sort of say, hey, you know, you're in the city, but there's still waterways, there's still sun. But Dobbin still gets up every single morning. There's still the moon. Um, there, there's also, um, in terms of mobilizing the city and, and solidarity, the city has provides kind of endless opportunities. So it was sort of supposed to be kind of a motivator for indigenous youth that way. And it was so wonderful to listen to all, listen and watch all four versions of this story. I'm, I'm thinking about the, uh, the maple syrup as the sort of counter narrative to the extraction, sort of late state capitalism of the extraction, and wondering both what kind of vocabulary we can give to it, where we're taking something and kind of extracting, but perhaps not, that's not the best word. And, and then this question of suturing afterwards and repair, but the notion that we'll puncture the, the tree, but then it will repair itself. And I was just curious how that sort of secondary process is framed. The trees, um, the trees heal themselves. And so, so in springtime, um, water is, is very much present. Um, because the snow is melting, the ice on the lakes is melting, so there's precipitation that comes as rain instead of snow. Um, so it's almost like a, a, a cleansing and a preparing for sort of all of the new life of, of spring. Um, the sap is considered to be a, a medicine and like a, a cleanse that people would drink the sap. Um, so the sugar bush itself is this um, beautiful, happy, full of laughter. Uh, the winter's over, the spring is coming, um, and, and sort of the relationship with the, the maple trees. Um, they're, they're putting so much sap through their system, we're taking a little bit, and um, living in for, for hundreds and hundreds of years in this very, very sustainable, reciprocal um, way with them. I think it's not something that we take when, it's not something we take for granted. Um, I feel like we worry about hurting, if we're hurting the tree, we worry about the health of the tree. Um, we will often give trees a rest. Um, the trees will scar over and heal themselves um, really, really quickly um, by the end of the season. So it's something that we're attentive to. Um, and then I think the, the healing um, comes in the form of spring and this rebirth, this continual rebirth. So that, that this idea of minimal mazawin or continual rebirth is sort of a, a very foundational ethic of how to live your life. You should be living your life in a way where you are generating more life um, rather than sort of um, in the context of my modern life, um, the opposite of, of killing things and of, of eliminating and of stopping more life. So um, I think it's, I think people see it as a life giving sort of process. And then the boiling of the sap is very much um, an interaction between fire and heat and light and water and managing and watching and learning from, from that relationship. Were there other people who have questions that they want to get? I might just raise another um, some, uh, kind of discussion that we had earlier in the reading group around forms of um, what you said, thinking with. And uh, we've talked in relation to being out of the bridge about solidarities internationally. And I think just if you would say another, there have been various 
there's been attention to a lot of different um, systems of indigenous knowledge and cosmologies in various contexts over the last few years, and also discussions about problems around appropriation or um, the kind of projection onto different indigenous uh, cultures of the possibility of saving us all in some way that you know comes back to indigenous people somehow having to do the work for everyone else or they're not just the appropriate for the us web. So I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more about this thinking with concept that you raised before. So I think you're right in the sense that it's very important to be aware of the political context um, that I live in, in Canada, which is one where um, everything, sort of from land to body to ways of thinking to language to children, has been um, historically and contemporary, contemporarily taken. And so one of the things that um, we talk a lot about in academic circles is then you don't want the knowledge to be seen as just something that can be taken as well. Um, and that misused. What I like about um, talking about what it is to be human, for instance, or what it means to adopt certain technologies with other indigenous people, for instance, Maori people or Hawaiian people, is that the conversations that we have is, is sort of how do, how do Anishinaabe people think about this? Or how do, how do you think through this? And then we go back and forth sort of sharing stories and experiences and language. And um, I, though they're my favorite conversations because they're so generative. And so I think with my work, that's the sort of conversations that I want to continue with other audiences of, of thinking through together. Uh, how do you think about this? What are alternative ways that we can think about this? How do I think about this as an Anishinaabe person? Because it makes an intervention into colonial thought in terms of positioning indigenous people as thinking intellectual people that have something to contribute. Um, it's not taking the knowledge away from a holder or from a person. It's keeping it attached to, to, um, to my body and to my ancestors and to my land and to my language. Um, and it's not asking you to become Anishinaabe or to become indigenous. It's saying, it's sort of more of a conversation um, amongst peoples of the world. Um, and I think that those, those conversations are pretty important to have happening outside of sort of replicating the, um, the power relations, the asymmetrical power relations of a colonial kind of relationship. So it's trying to articulate um, politics and ethics and intellectual thought uh, while also troubling the relationship um, that colonialism has given to us to have those conversations through. I think that one of the things that 
uh, underlies all four versions of these stories is um, almost a celebration of, of difference. And this um, recognition and affirmation that living beings um, have, have, uh, have some self-determination and some freedom to decide how they're going to live in the world and how they're going to construct the world. And that the role of, of the family or the people that are around supporting that living being is to bring out the best. And I think um, my nation, my community, my family, myself, <coughs> we operate the best collectively when we're all being our best individual selves. And so colonialism has been a gigantic violent imposition on that across those scales. Um, but I think away from sort of the universality of we're all human and we all have something to learn from this, I think the hope is that, um, that people will be able to find themselves in the story and um, sort of maybe think a little bit differently about, about their own lives, about their own self, about their own relationships, um, and, and have that that's what I mean by sort of a thinking, a thinking through together. So this is a pretty radically different way of organizing life and constructing a world. Um, and I think at this point in our shared human history, there's um, a pretty big interest, at least among some segments of some societies in terms of figuring out a different relationship to the land and to each other. And so I think that this is, this is a part, I see me being here today as part of that collective process. Unless anyone has any other um, comments or questions that they would like to raise, then please join me in thanking Leon very much for being with us today.